the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan? So thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Um, first, a scheduling update. We will not be having a meeting next Wednesday, July 4th. I hope that we will all be barbecuing and celebrating Independence Day with our friends and family. Um, the other scheduling update is our press release out for the month of July. We have copies up on the table for the public and our website um, is being momentary, it will be updated momentarily uh, with those July meetings. It's a very busy month. We have the exchange, we have some public, special public comment um, session, so please check out our schedule. Um, the second announcement is that I will be, I, I will be reading a, a rate that the board um, uh, decided on this week, and that is, it's three dockets actually. Um, the board has issued decisions in dockets number 005, 006, and 007 of 2018. These filings are affected for the third and fourth quarters of 2018. Um, they are for the MVP large and grandfather small group plan, plans and filings. Um, for the large group POS rider, the board reduced the rate from 3.8% to 2.32%. For the small group grandfather, the board reduced the rate from 2.1% to 0.8%. These orders are posted on the GNCP website as well as all other material related to these filings. And the last item is that I would like to add something to the agenda today, and that is the Green Mountain Care Board budget update. So this is our own Green Mountain Care Board budget. We, we do have a budget um, that will be starting July 1st for the state, so we wanted to wait until that, all that was settled to give the board and the public an update on um, our internal budget. So that would come, I guess it would be item number four after the all year model update. Okay. Okay, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 13th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 13th without any deletions, additions, or corrections. Um, any discussion? Say none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And, and uh, at this point, we'll uh, welcome the all Fair model team up to the podium.
Medicare Next Generation Program uh, for 2019, and we'll describe some of the areas under consideration. And then finally, um, we're going to discuss uh, all payer model reporting, so that includes uh, reporting to CMS and legislative reports that will be um, so, as you know, the all payer model agreement contains what we call scale targets. Those are targets for the numbers of Vermont Medicare beneficiaries and Vermont all payer scale target beneficiaries that are aligned to a scale target ACO ratio. So, essentially, in order to be scale targets, they have to be attributed under a scale target ACO initiative. Um, the scale target ACO initiative is defined as basically an ACO arrangement that meets four requirements. First, the program has to offer the possibility of shared savings to the ACO. Uh, it achieves goals related to quality of care or utilization. Second, the ACO must be able to receive at least 30 percent of shared savings, and if it is going to be responsible for shared losses, which is not a requirement, uh, it has to be responsible for at least 30 percent of, of losses. Third, the ACO benchmark, shared savings, shared losses, or combination have to be tied to the quality of care the ACO delivers, the health of its aligned beneficiaries, or both. So in other words, the ACO's financial performance has to be tied to its quality. And finally, services comparable to uh, what are called all payer financial target services and their associated expenditures must be included for determining the ACO shared losses or shared savings. Uh, all payer financial target services is obviously a defined term. This is a definition of the agreement. Um, for Medicare, this is Part A and Part B e services, including the benefit enhancements authorized under a Medicare ACO program. And for other payers, they're basically comparable services, namely acute hospital inpatient and outpatient care, post acute care, professional services, and durable medical equipment for DMA. So these are the four ACO programs or initiatives um, operating in 2018. Um, one for Medicare, one for Medicaid, one commercial program uh, offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield, and one self-funded program offered by EVMC. Uh, we've given you the uh, number of attributed lives there for each of the programs as of the beginning of this year. Um, as you know, the beginning of the year attribution is, is basically the high point attribution for the program. Um, the number of attributed lives are expected to decrease throughout the year. Um, the attrition probably different rates for different payers. Um, also, a note for the self-funded program, uh, that contract was executed in May, which is kind of enabling us to do this look across all four programs now. But it is effective for the entire calendar year. It's that January first, twenty eighteen. So, as I mentioned, the first requirement for a scale target ACO initiative is that there be a possibility for the ACO to share savings. Each of the four twenty eighteen programs meets this requirement. So that's probably the easiest slide we will have today. Um, the second requirement, as I mentioned, is that the ACO will be able to receive at least 30% of shared savings, and if they're going to be responsible for shared losses, also 30%. Um, this requirement also appears to be satisfied for all four programs. Uh, for the Medicare program, there's a 5% risk corridor um, within which one care will be eligible for 80% of savings and responsible for 80% of losses. For the Medicaid program, it's a 3% risk corridor within which one care will be eligible for 100% of savings and responsible for 100% of losses. For the Blue Cross program, 6% uh, corridor 
50-50 shared savings, shared losses, and the um, DVMC program is a shared savings only, so there's a 10% uh, cap and up to that cap, uh, one care get 30% of the savings. So the third requirement uh, are that the services be comparable to all payer financial target services. Um, for, for Medicare, uh, obviously that's met um, uh, the services included for determining shared savings and shared losses for Medicare Part A and Part B services. For the Medicaid program, um, comparable services are included, uh, including inpatient and outpatient hospital care, professional services, home health and hospice, and durable medical equipment. Um, as one care has pointed out, while it is responsible for um, spending on durable medical equipment for its aligned beneficiaries, it does not have GME providers within its network and is actually prohibited under the Medicare program from having those providers in the network. services are uh, medical services covered under an attributed member's qualified health plan. So those would be your um, ACA, essential health benefits, state mandated benefits, um, and that contract also covers non-specialty funds. Um, the self-funded program from UVMC uh, covers medical services under an attributed member's medical benefit. Parenthetical there just because I think we need to better understand a little bit what uh, services are covered under, under the plan, but we expect that they are um, uh, aligned with all their financial services. Um, so the last requirement for Scale target ACO initiatives is, like I mentioned, that the ACO's financial performance be tied to its quality performance. So for Medicare, 2018 is a reporting year. So if one care reports on quality measures in the contract, it will not be penalized. Um, for Medicaid, Blue Cross, and UMC, those contracts each require one care to create a quality incentive pool. Based on the ACO's performance on the quality measures in the contract, one care will be able to distribute some or all of the funds uh, to its network. Um, in any amount that is not distributed to the network, half of that would go to the ACO for quality initiatives, and half would go back to the payer. to the scale target ACO initiative requirements, but related, um, the all payer model agreement requires ACO programs in Vermont to reasonably align in certain key areas, uh, including beneficiary alignment or attribution methodologies, quality measures, risk arrangements, payment mechanisms, and services included for determining shared savings and shared losses. alignment or attribution. Just a cautionary note here, this is a pretty complicated topic, and this, this slide affects our best understanding at the moment of how each of the four attribution methodologies work. Um, we've obviously tried to simplify it some, um, but basically all the programs use a claims-based prospective alignment methodology under which someone can be attributed to the ACO if they have received a majority of certain primary care type services within a two-year look-back period from a physician or other professional that is part of the ACO. Um, 
some key differences, uh, or potential differences that we think exist um, are that Medicare allows non-primary care specialists to attribute a beneficiary. The beneficiary has received uh, very few services from a primary care provider. Um, that does not, uh, so that is not an option under the Medicaid contract or the uh, other two contracts. Second, Medicare and Medicaid weight claims that occur in the most recent year of that two-year back period more heavily than claims in the first year. Um, that does not appear to be the case for commercial and uh, supplement program. And finally, for the commercial and self-funded programs, the 40 year claims, um, there's a look at whether the member has selected a primary care provider. So if your plan requires you to select a primary care provider and you've done so, then you're going to be treated, and that primary care provider is going to be the ACO, you're going to be treated to the ACO through that care provider that you've selected. So the next key area for mine is in quality measures. And uh, this table, um, which Michelle created, uh, outlines how the quality measures in the Medicaid, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and EVMC um, agreements, how they align with the measures in the welfare model agreement. So for the Medicaid program, uh, 10 out of the 12 measures align with the DLPAIR model measures for the commercial program, 8 out of 12, and for the uh, UVMC program, 6 out of 9. And if you have questions about this slide, uh, this table, which goes on to the next slide, um, Michelle will have it here. So the next key area for alignment is in payment mechanisms. And this slide describes, uh, describes those mechanisms between uh, the payers and one care. So within the Medicare and Medicaid programs, there is an all-inclusive population-based payment for certain providers, namely this year hospitals and uh, those independent primary care practices that are participating in the one care CDR pilot program. All of the providers are paid for your service. For the Blue Cross and UVMC programs, it is fee for service across the board. There are no all inclusive population based payments, but there are um, per beneficiary per month payments to one care to support certain aspects of its programs or operations. Um, I'll try to set those out there in a second. Uh, alignment areas are in terms of um, uh, risk arrangements and the services that are included for determining shared savings and shared losses, which I already covered in the um, previous slides about scale targeting initiatives. So, so that covers alignment. I guess before we move on to a different portion of the presentation, do you have any questions? Or do you want to say it at the end? Yeah. Uh, I just had one question when you talk about the shared savings and tying that to the quality metrics. Do we have an understanding of how that would be how that is aligned with the ACO as far as if somebody misses one of the quality metrics? I mean, how much gets held back? Is there a table that goes through that? Yes, there is a table for. Um, Medicaid, commercial, and self-funded programs. Um, for the Medicare program, our understanding is uh, the ACO is reporting only, so if they don't report, um, if they, I guess if they don't report one of the measures, there, there might be financial penalty uh, in terms of the benchmark being reduced. And so there's a table on that. I don't think we have a totally clear understanding on whether it would be 100% of, 100 
percent is a one percent reduction in benchmark. So okay, we so can get clarification. It's clear though what what happens if it's yeah, and so specifically we'll need to those Medicaid commercial and EDMC. but I think it would be interesting at some point to get an update from the payers around uh, sort of what they're thinking about in terms of 2018 uh, and any ideas they may have for 2019. And you all should think about the timing vis-a-vis -vis the ACO budget process, but uh, it's great that we hear regularly from our staff and from the ACO, but it would be also nice to hear from the payers. in their participation agreement 
is put at board composition, and we'd like that to match up with our Rule 5 requirements for board composition. So we are currently discussing that with Medicare. As well, the beneficiary notification, we would like to simplify, and um, we are working with one care who is working with the healthcare advocate on that. And then I mentioned um, the last time we met that we are looking at the provider list deadline for September to better align with our process here in order to get the benchmark data sooner. I mentioned contribution, but that's still in the very beginning stages and would not be until 2020. of 
healthcare advocate looked at those and provided comment as well. That all took place in uh, 2017. We were already thinking ahead about um, 2019. And after that, uh, Michelle and I sat down and had a series of meetings with One Care and the healthcare advocate to see if we could achieve consensus on the two different sets. They weren't terribly far apart. And so um, Julia Shaw from the Healthcare Advocate and um, Sarah Berry and others from One Care participated. And we ended up um, being able to develop a consensus measure set to propose to CMMI. We did that. CMMI uh, took a look at the, we ended up with a set of 15 consensus measures. CMMI took a look at that, made some tweaks to it, um, asked that we remove actually a couple of measures. And so the consensus set that we have for your consideration and that Michelle is about to present consists of 13 measures. We took CMMI's feedback back to One Care and to the HCA so they're aware. Um, and so our next step is to bring it to you for review and um, hopefully ultimate approval. We, you know, we feel like we, we feel good about the progress that we've made here. I think you'll see when Michelle presents the set that there's quite a bit of alignment with the all-payer model measures. We also need to make sure we had some next-gen measures in there as well, because CMMI will have some interest in comparing Vermont's ACO performance to how next-gen ACOs are doing nationally. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Michelle and let her go through. the mechanism 
for um, determining how pain is impacted by the ACO's performance. So that's um, a little down the road. We'll continue to engage the ACO and HCA and CMMI in those discussions and anticipate that in the fairly near future we'll be bringing a proposal back to you in terms of payment and financial impact for your consideration. But the issue at hand is the slate of measures that we present. So on the quality measures, um, is it your plan to post those for public comment today? Yes. And what period of time do we leave it open? I mean, I would think a week or a bit more. A little more, maybe a little more than that, because I realize next week is the holiday, so yeah. maybe. So why don't we, we do a 10 day two? public comment period and with a possible vote on July 11th? Sounds good. Does that work? Yes. Good. It works. So I don't, do you want to take questions specific to this now, or do we want to move on? We just have a few more slides. Okay. We'll just stay here in case there are questions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we did review some of these slides with you back in May, but wanted to go through them in a little bit more detail today. Um, we wanted to, to, to um, talk about the total cost of care quarterly and annual report. We've been working on that specification and we're really happy to say that we're in the final stretch of completion of it. Um, it's nearing an 80-page specification and has become quite complicated but very clear in the end. So we and CMMI will use this to calculate and validate our total cost of care for each quarter. And we have a meeting with CMMI in July to discuss the specification. Um, the review that Mike just completed of the contracts will be a part of the ACO scale target and alignment report that's due in June of 2019. So we're ahead of the curve on that one, which is exciting. And then the first quality and health outcomes report is due September 30th, 2019. Um, so each of these has been their own stream of work, frankly, to define what measures were specifying and clarify with their stakeholders and take to CMMI. So um, we're very excited that each of them are almost complete and we will be able to start calculating the total cost of care for the first quarter of 2018 soon. So down below, we have the one-time reports and the payer differential reports, there are two. Um, we have started the work on that as well. And so the payer differential report examines the rates by payer and impacts that if those, if those have any differences on the ACO. And it also examines network adequacy to determine if there are any significant differences among payers. Um, per the agreement, the Green Mountain Care Board and AHS shall ensure that Medicaid is a reliable payer within the model. And so this may include any recommendations necessary to increase Vermont Medicaid reimbursement rates to levels more comparable to Medicare fee-for-service rates. Um, you may recall that Medicaid had some pricing increases in 2016 and 2017, and we are taking those into consideration now, and it will be also be included in the total cost of care specification for finalizing the, um, the all-payer model target specification. <coughs> so there are also several AHS reports, and um, we will be meeting with our new director of healthcare reform soon on those to determine uh, how we can collaborate Luckily, those are a little bit further into the future. And then finally, these are very small, so I apologize, but um, they, it basically runs through uh, the first two years of our agreement for the claims incurred, when claims are paid, then when they're received in VCARES, and then when they can actually be calculated. So this shows why we have a lag from the first quarter to the last quarter for the first report of 2018. And this is outlining when we are collecting the information on the uh, scale target initiatives and when it will be reported to CMMI. And finally, also the health outcomes report. So we will be doing the analysis in the first two quarters of 2019 on all of the data from 2018 for the quality of care reports. Going into the Act 124 reports, which were um, both, there was reporting for both us and AHS on the ACO initiatives. 
we just submitted a June 15th report to the legislature on our performance year one of the ACO model agreement that's on our website as well as on the legislative website. We will have another one due in September and another due in December. And then we have a report due on August 1st to begin to look at the ACO attribution and scale target analysis and another one due November 1st of 2018 for the total cost of care and quality. So we will see those this summer and now we're ready for discussion. Thank you. I'll open it up to the board for... Can, can I, can I ask you a question? Go yes, ahead. not the board, but the executive director. There is a report due from the ACO on June 30th, right? The, yep, there will be a report due on, it's the parent, it's a parent parental report that's examining their capitated pilot model yep. and also provider burden. So that will be coming in shortly. Great. Thank you. So I have a question is um, that relates to how this unfolds over time um, in terms of the total cost of care, for example. Um, as I understand, the baseline is uh, 2017, and sometime in the near future, uh, you know, we, will, we will have a better understanding of what that is in detail. But you know, as, as the board moves forward, um, uh, issues come before us, and we make decisions about them that could affect uh, the total cost of care. I mean, what happens if uh, 25 new um, acute care psychiatric beds come online in 2020? Um, and uh, you know, they're inpatient, and there's going to be um, expenditures associated with those that I would think would affect the total cost of care. But those bed didn't, beds didn't exist in, in um, 2017. So how does the system accommodate changes in the infrastructure um, that are, are just not the kind of normal growth impacts of decisions and other processes relate to total cost of care. We're working on um, some tools for you, uh, specifically around rate review to make, make things a little bit clearer as, as to understanding what certain decisions might be in terms of total cost of care. But in terms of things like um, the CON process, uh, so the all payer total cost of care per beneficiary growth is a, a claims-based measure and it wouldn't account for things like um, capital spending by a hospital on the emergency department. So, if I could jump in as well, I think that with your specific example, the one thing to remember is, as uh, Mike went over earlier, there are only certain services that we are accountable for. And uh, for Medicaid, that's, I can't now remember the percentage of the total, but it is a smaller percentage than, for example, commercial or Medicare. And that was in, in part by design because, for example, at the time we were negotiating, it was clear that there needed to be investments in mental health. So I'm not sure if the psych beds actually do count. That's something we have to go back to the 80-page spec and kind of crosswalk it back. Uh, but, for example, prescription drug spending uh, we're not accountable for in the target. So I think there's like kind of a two-stage process of um, with particular new investments is determining whether or not there's a service that is actually counted in the total cost of care. And then uh, if it's something like an increase in Medicaid spending, we also have the provision that says for price increases, we can be held harmless because the federal government wanted to incent the state to bring up Medicaid provider rates. And then there's also an exogenous factors clause, which um, you know, basically we could try to use if there's something really unexpected. And that analysis in part will be done through the parent differential report each year. So it's laid out in the agreement. Okay, other questions from the board? This time, uh, uh, Pat, I know I asked you this privately, but I think it would be good to, you know, talk about in public the uh, 
two um, quality measures that were dropped by CMMI, and you know what the procedure was then go back to the ACL and talk about those, because it was probably a surprise, I guess, that CMMI come out and drop measures versus adding them. Yeah, I mean, again, I think what CMMI was really looking for was they were they were looking for what um, measures overlapped with the next gen program. They wanted to make sure that there was a significant overlap there so that there could be that national comparison. And they also wanted to see overlap with our all-payer model measures because of their keen interest in alignment. If all payers are aligned, then that means that there's some critical mass behind some of these quality improvement initiatives. Um, CMMI, um, we, of the 15 measures that we presented to them, they did um, ask us to drop a couple. One was um, pneumonia vaccination for older adults, uh, and the other was skilled nursing facility 30-day um, readmissions. And you know, I can't. Uh, they didn't go into tremendous detail on why. I did get the sense from talking with them that they were interested in having a, 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 a what they considered to be a reasonable size measure set so that providers and the ACO could focus in certain areas. Um, those were the two measures that they um, asked that, that we drop. Um, we took that back to the ACO and HCA, discussed it, um, decided, I think, you know, I, I could let them speak for themselves if they wish to for any public comment, but, you know, I think we decided that there was a, it was a pretty well-rounded set of measures. It hits on chronic illness treatment. It hits, you know, pretty significantly on mental health and substance use disorder treatment, which um, both they and we have identified as a key area. It, um, there are measures related to readmission and, um, and unplanned admissions, so that speaks to the interface between the ambulatory care providers and hospital providers. So, uh, and, and obviously um, measures that they saw more related to children simply because of the population. Um, they, you know, we didn't actually propose those. So, uh, we, you know, we felt, uh, we were actually very pleased that out of 15 measures that we presented to them, that they agreed with virtually all of them. We thought that was a very good sign. You know, the skilled nursing facility measure, there's, you know, small, there is a small numbers issue potentially there, so that one might have been a little harder um, to, uh, to, to calculate. Anyway, there's some volatility in that measure. But, so I can't speak specifically why we got the feedback, but um, felt very pleased that they were as open to the slate of measures as we put forth this year. Thank you. Okay, anything else from the board? If not, I'll open it up at this time to uh, members of the public for questions or comments. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Berry from Winter Vermont. And I just wanted to start by thanking the staff of the board. This has been a tremendous process from our standpoint that was very thoughtful, engaging information directly on patient experience of care. So from our provider standpoint, uh, we really feel like we're in a good position moving forward into 2019 to be able to really affect some of the change that we all want to see, particularly when it comes to the all-payer model goals and making sure that we are doing everything we can to support substance use uh, disorder treatment and mental health concerns, chronic disease management, as well as making sure that we have measures and alignment around wellness care and prevention. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I also want to thank Pat for all of her hard work um, and all the Green Mountain Care Board staff for working on this issue and for including us in the process. Um, we were happy with the 13 measures that um, came out of the process. I just wanted to also note that we um, did discuss keeping the skilled nursing facility measure as a reporting measure. Um, and I think in general, the HCA um, will continue to look for 
additional state oversight of um, quality within the ACO. So um, looking beyond kind of the negotiation with CMS and um, the things that the parish will be looking for, having some additional board oversight of um, quality of care of the ACO. And we also will continue to work um, with One Care and uh, Diva and the board with trying to implement um, an additional patient experience measure around shared decision making, um, something that would be at the point of care. So that's something we'll continue to work on as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Other comments or questions from the public? Yes. So um, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont <coughs> Developmental Disabilities Council. And um, I have two questions. One was for the year that um, ended, 2017, which was supposed to be, I guess, under the um, APM terms, year zero. If you go back a couple of slides, it doesn't seem like there's any reporting for 2017 data that's being planned for. So I'm wondering if, when and how the Green Mountain Care Board is going to collect and report on the 2017 data. I know it was premature for the June 15th report that was just submitted, but I was sort of expecting to see it accounted for in the charts that you had up there, and I didn't see 2017 anywhere. So that's one question, and I'll just leave it at that for today. So one care had one next generation contract in 2017, and that was with Medicaid. And one care does plan to present their, their results through Medicaid, either um, hopefully in July or August when they come back to present this year. Medicaid is also doing quarterly reports on their implementation of that payer contract. 2017 is a baseline year, so we will be using that to then calculate their forward, but we are not starting to measure performance of the ACO until 2018. Do you have any questions? And we also reported to the legislature starting, I, I'm confusing my years, but I think we had quarterly reports on, on, on implementation, and those were reported you know, every quarter to the legislature for I think it might have been Act 113, actually. Okay. And I would just, um, um, if it's okay, look to um, Sarah and Spencer, but I believe the Medicare program will be reported the way it normally is through, um, you know, Medicare each fall usually issues reports on performance, so that will be um, out there as well. Susan, you had a second question as well? Um, oh, I'll leave it for today. Okay. I saw another hand back in front of you. Well, we're like off topic here, but since it's the public comment period, um, I'm Deb Snell, president of AFT Vermont, and I just wanted to raise some concerns about what's going on at the UVM Medical Center with the nurses' negotiations. Um, as you know, we are bargaining our contract with the hospital management right now, and we're passing out a letter um, from our members that are on the bargaining team right now about where we're at and why we're in the position we're in right now, possibly going on strike in the next few days, or issuing our strike notice <coughs> in the next few days. Um, we have two sessions left, um, and things are not going well. We are very far apart at the table. One of the big concerns we have is the number of travelers in our institution. In the last three years, the hospital has spent approximately $21.3 million on traveling nurses. If we end up going on strike, which is a very strong possibility at this point, um, it's going to cost the hospital in salary alone about $1.2 million a day. If they decide to lock us out for potentially up to five days, it could cost up to $6 million, and that doesn't even include housing, and we're well aware that the hospital is right now looking for hotel rooms for like five, 600 nurses and not doing so well with that. Um, this is a huge expense when it comes down to our bargaining, what we're looking for over the next three years for nurses' salaries to attract and retain and keep nurses at our hospital and in Vermont. Our total package is right around that 21.3 million mark for the next three years. So we're asking for support from the Green Mountain Care Board and the public 
that instead of spending money on travelers that the hospital invests in the nurses that are there. And I also have with me um, Angela Pratt, who is on the bargaining team. Yes. My name is Angela Pratt. I've been a nurse at UVMMC for 32 years. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little cold. And I've been asked to give you an update on our bargaining in, uh, with Deb. So we started bargaining March 29th, and we've had 13 three-hour sessions. Our bargaining consi committee consists of about 30 staff nurses, nurses just like me, our union leadership, a couple of staffers, and our lawyer. Uh, we worked very diligently to prepare for our contract bargaining, um, and we, on March 29th, submitted our entire proposal package to our management team. They were not prepared to bargain back. Um, and it's a little bit typical and a little bit frustrating um, <clears throat> when we ask for specific proposals that we want to work on, the ones that are stickier, the ones that are harder to come to agreement on, they would not hand them back. Um, and what they did hand us were proposals from three years ago, verbatim, things they proposed. And, and the language was the same. And it's for, for the nurses, it would be a huge step backwards. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so when we work towards an agreement, it doesn't really feel like our management is bargaining in good faith with us. Um, to the point that we sent out uh, a question of a strike vote to our members. There's 1,800 nurses that work for UVMMC, and about 1,300 of them voted on the 10th, 11th, and 12th with a 94% strike authorization vote. So to give the bargaining committee the, um, the ability to strike if we do not come to agreement. We have two sessions this week, today and tomorrow. Um, if we do give a strike notice, it'll be on June 29th. That'll be a 10-day strike notice. And as Deb was saying, it's very expensive for us to strike because we don't we go without wages, and for the hospital to pay people to replace us. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, it feels. <laughs> like infringing on our dignity to get to this point. Um, as the UVMMC network expands with us having connections with all of the feeder hospitals, our population is getting sicker <coughs> and we're getting much more acute patients. Um, one of our sticking points is that we are asking for safe, safe staffing ratios. These are in alignment with a national um, American Nursing Association uh, agreement. So, so what we're asking for is, is very reasonable. We want to take good care of our patients, and we know we need to be staffed at a certain ratio to do that. Um, so those are, our, uh, of course, wages is our other sticking point. As Deb said, to retain and attract nurses, we have to pay competitive wages. Um, so thank you very much. I'm asking for your support in this upcoming week. So thank you. Uh, obviously, we're not here about any contract negotiation. Can't really uh, take any actions to support either side. Um, our hope, obviously, is that the two sides um, have a fruitful negotiation and that uh, everyone wins in the end. With that, we'll turn it back to public comment on anything uh, related to the all-pair model agreement. Seeing none at this point, I um, want to thank uh, the team for a good presentation and update for us. And we'll ask uh, Jean to come up and just uh, give the board and the public an update. <laughs>
not the least of which is all paramount on that education that we just reviewed. This was a slide um, recommended first this year by the Department of Finance and Management, and it's an excellent slide to give an overview. All departments presenting to the legislature did this. Um, it highlights our mission, but if you look at our at the bottom left hand corner of the pie chart, it shows followed our budget over 
is in recognition of the fact that we have lost federal and local commitment funds. So those are the corresponding changes. Now, so the question is, one question that could be asked is the um, state of Vermont and the legislature is choosing to spend $8 million on the Green Home Care Board. Many of the resources that we have at the board were also there at Vishka prior to DFR prior to the board's creation. However, through Act 48 and Green Mountain Care Board Rule 2.00, the board completes a broader review than DFR did prior to 2014. And if we look back for our benchmark evaluation for fiscal year 18, um, you can see for Blue Cross Blue Shield in the Green Mountain Care Board's decision, there were four, $14.4 million savings for Vermont Health Connect insured population, and in MVP, there was $1.8 million in savings to the Vermont Health Connect insured population. If you look at the rate that was proposed versus the rate approved. For a hospital budget, you can see the same correlation. If the, the rate that was approved is lower than the rate that was proposed. Now, if you look at the history overall, what this shows is the history overall of net patient revenue increases, which is one of the benchmarks that's used by the board.
there's some something to report of substance, uh, I'm happy to come back and let you know. But at this point, it's been sort of organizational and getting started on outlining the work this, for the summer. Super. Is there any other old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.